Kalali Castle stands around nine miles west of Anik. It's a Grade 1 listed building, although there is no public access. Architects divided the house into private apartments in 1987 and it has been a private residence ever since. Except the castle features a bit of an odd history, as many castles in the northeast of England do, and the fairy folk make an appearance in the story of its foundation. Though to be fair, there's a slight whiff of the land spirit about these fairies. So in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore, we're going to ask ourselves, was the location of Kalali Castle really picked by fairies? Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. You may or may not have noticed that my voice sounds a little bit different this week, and indeed, last week I told you that I would be flying to Verona on Sunday the 22nd of May. It is, however, the 24th of May, and I'm still sitting in my house because I tested positive for COVID on Sunday morning. Thankfully, it was before I actually went out of the airport. I basically feel a bit rubbish (laughs) to put it mildly it's like every part of my body aches and obviously I sound like this although quite frankly I'd actually probably keep the voice because I think it sounds quite cool at least it does in my head so I did decide to record this episode anyway because I had actually already written the blog post that it goes with so I thought well you know what I might as well record it while I still feel relatively awake and then basically I'm going for a nap when I finish this but anyway that's my update for the moment This is going to be the final episode in our different kinds of fairy month. It has turned out slightly different than I was expecting because I wasn't really expecting to end up with quite so many fairies which also have crossovers with other types of entity as well. But there we go, that was a quite cool thing that came out of it. In June, we're going to have a look at stuff to do with witches because that was the third thing in the poll that I asked way back in March. And I'm going to specifically look at tales of like individual specific witches from different parts of the British Isles. But this is, as I say, the final one in our fairy month and I love this story. I've known this one again since I was about 10 maybe, possibly younger. The book I first found it in is called More Ghosts and Legends of Northumbria and the date inside it is 1989. So that gives you an idea how long these kind of books that we've got in the house have been kicking around. So there we go. So like I said in the introduction, Killali Castle stands around nine miles or so west of Anik. Anik, you would probably recognised from a certain film franchise because in the first two it did stand in for Hogwarts and Anik basically is just awesome and of course obviously they have the Anik Garden where you'll find the Poison Garden which obviously is a constant source of inspiration for myself. But anyway back to Kalali Castle. The rough origins really date to a peel tower which was built in the 14th or 15th century and you often get these kind of towers in this neck of the woods. It was a really common type of dwelling during the era of sort of the border reavers. But interestingly, the Peel Tower stood near an Iron Age hill fort, and we are going to come back to that later because that is quite important. But a man named John Clavering incorporated the Peel Tower into a new house in 1619, and it actually became the West Wing of this new house. So obviously by the 17th century, it was a little bit easier to sort of have like more of a house rather than a Peel Tower. But then more alterations changed the fabric of the house in 1676, And sadly, most of these early features disappeared beneath later additions in 1707. The Claverings held on to the house until 1877, so they'd obviously had it for a fair few centuries, and then they sold the property. And the next owner, Alexander Brown, carried out yet more alterations and restoration work in the 1890s. So it's really hard to know exactly what Kalali Castle might have looked like in the past. Different apartments within the castle do periodically come up for sale, So every now and then they appear on things like the Evening Chronicle, which is like Newcastle's local newspaper and so on. Or they sometimes pop up on property websites and they're usually anywhere between like half a million up over. And they always look amazing and you think, oh, how amazing would it be to have Kalali Castle as your address? So you get to see what it looks like inside now, but no way of knowing what it used to look like, which is a shame. But we do need to go way back further to the point before construction and to really dig into the story, we're essentially going back to the 12th century for this one. And Lord and Lady Kalali wanted to build a new castle. 
So they toured their estates looking for the best location. And Lord Kalali believed he'd found the ideal spot. And it was perched on a hill overlooking the village and it would be easily defended in case of an attack by the Scots. Now Lady Kalali disagreed with this because the high location would also make any castle built there incredibly windy and she favoured a much more sheltered site down in the valley. So for her, comfort came before defensibility. Now they couldn't reach an agreement so Lord Kalali sent for Master James who was a highly sought after castle builder at the time. And he surveyed the site on the hill and then came up with a design compromise that would suit both parties. So the location and defences would suit Lord Kalali and then there were sheltered rooms and a garden for Lady Kalali. So having each gotten what they wanted, they finally agreed and work began on the new castle. Now the foundations were sunk and all seemed well, but when the stonemasons and builders began to lay the courses for the walls, things started going awry. The team would return to the site each morning to find their work from the day before had been torn asunder, and blocks of stone lay strewn all over the site. So work had to begin anew every day, and Master James, understandably I think, got bored with the disruption and assumed that someone was playing a trick on them. So one night he sent the men home for the day, but remained behind, hidden on the hill. Now according to one version of the story, but this is not all of them, the fairies only appeared when the last light was extinguished in the village. They tore up the stones, flinging them around the hill as they went, and a song accompanied their demolition work. Kalali Castle built on a height, up in a day, down in a night, build it down in the shepherd's shore, it will stand forever and never fall. So Master James ran down to Lord Kalali to make his report, because he knew exactly where to find shepherd's shore. So, sick of the endless disruption, Lord Kalali decided to build the new Kalali Castle there instead. And surprise, surprise, it's still there. But the story itself doesn't end there, because... Obviously nobody knows if Lady Kalali was essentially spinning a cute story to explain how she got her own way because there's various versions which actually claim that Lady Kalali was actually in cahoots with the fairies but then North of the Tyne website also references another version of the story which places Lady Kalali in the role of villain and in this one Master James actually sees what he thinks is a ball coming out of the trees and then tearing all of this building work down. And then obviously he panics when he sees the boar and then goes to tell Lord Kalali, who then waits himself. He also sees the boar, hears the advice about prospective locations and then decides to obey. Now this one, obviously it's not an actual boar that's tearing everything down. It's actually a servant dressed as a boar. I'm a little bit sceptical about that one because I can't help thinking it would take more than one servant to tear down building work. But there we go. According to Paranormal Database, the stones fell down during the building work and a disembodied voice passed on the rhyme, not fairies or a boar. Now their website also claims that the new castle is plagued by noises allegedly made by a phantom priest, but I can't find any mention of those anywhere else. But we're focusing on the fairies here. So why would fairies interfere with building work? Well, the idea of a supernatural force tearing down building work is a bit of a common one in English folklore. So, for example, we looked at why the Church of St Mary the Virgin at East Burkhold in Suffolk has a detached bell house in the earlier episode on churches and folklore. And just as briefly, in case you didn't hear that episode, in that legend, the devil kept pulling down the work done on the tower at night and the workmen essentially gave up and built their separate wooden bell house elsewhere. And that one was left alone. And this is quite a common trope, usually related to churches, and it perhaps explains why a building's location was suddenly moved during the construction process. And I've heard other people theorise that the fairies interfere if the building work is too close to their home. And to be fair, that one is completely understandable, because look at the way people react when they discover that a huge building is going to be started beside their home. They don't want the extra noise, or indeed a building blocking out whatever little daylight they actually get. And again, totally understandable. So fairies could be similar. Or perhaps they just don't want humans close to them, which would also be understandable. So for Claude Le Carteau, we can still spot land spirits through the behaviour of any creatures in older tales. So he points out that we can look for any creatures that are keeping watch over the land, perhaps governing who can enter, who can kill animals there. Are they demanding tributes from humans? Can the creatures command the elements or animals? And stories that include these aspects are more likely to be tales of land spirits and I think in some ways because in this one it appears that the fairies are governing who can build there that therefore does actually sound I think a little bit more like land spirits and of course there are obviously various accounts which do place land spirits and fairies in a very similar category. 
Now, obviously, the boar could have been a man in a costume, yes, or it could have been a land spirit trying to drive off invading humans. And even the rhyme ascribed to the fairies could essentially be a form of governance over the area. So the slippage between whether it's infernal influence, fairies or human mischief makes it a little bit difficult to tell. So is the story true? Well, we can turn to archaeology to find out if there is any grain of truth in this particular story. And archaeologists arrived on the site to do some exploratory work. And now they weren't interested in the Peel Tower or the Manor House in the Valley. That did totally not be beyond their interest, not bothered. And instead, they were interested in the Iron Age Hill Fort that I mentioned earlier. Because the locals believed the fort to actually be the site of the unfinished castle. Now, while excavating the fort, the archaeologists did discover the foundations of a stone castle dating to the 12th century. So could it be the original unfinished castle abandoned because of the fairies? Now, according to North of Tyne, the remains aren't actually that exceptional because the unfinished work is ascribed to financial difficulties or indeed the lack of a need for a castle at the time. Now, obviously, that makes sense because a peel tower is smaller than a castle would have been. And if you were having financial problems, then you'd obviously go for the cheaper option. That said, the foundations of the unfinished castle date to the 12th century and the Peel Tower dates to the 15th century. So why would a family wait 300 years to build their castle? Let me see what you think of that one. Now, while I've got you for this particular episode, there are also some other Kalali superstitions which do indicate a certain degree of oddity around the area, shall we say. And there's a fascinating superstition that actually links Kalali with the weather because there's a ravine between Law Bottle Moor and Castle Hill and mist would rise from this ravine and then cling to the top of the hill. And whenever it did this, locals would proclaim that Kalali Pot is boiling because it foretold rain. Now, the name Kalali Pot actually came from the fact that the Clavering family had a pot that they boiled every Sunday and they would use this to make dinner for the poor people who attended church services at their chapel. But also, the link between Kalali and fairies isn't actually as far-fetched as it seems because Kalali crags are near the castle and there's a deep fissure among them called Hob Thrush's Mill Nick. Try saying that quickly. And Hob Thrush actually refers to the local sprite who's considered to be a form of brownie, as hobs often are. And he apparently ground his grain at the mills. And I say mills in inverted commas because basically what would happen is waterfalls would bring stones down and then knock them into the potholes and then their rattling would basically sound like the grinding of a mill. And that's where the name came from. So there's already this link between Kalali and the surrounding area, particularly the topography of the site, but then also this idea that there is a local sprite already on site. So is it that far-fetched to assume that there might be others? So ultimately, what do we make of it all? Well, it is essentially up to you. Did the intended castle fall foul of the local fairies? Were the land spirits annoyed about the building project and drive them away? Did Lady Kalali use her servants and local superstitions to con her husband into building on a site of her choosing? Or did they just do their sums and realise the money didn't add up? You decide. And that is the end of this week's episode. Kind of glad in a way because obviously all that talking's actually made my lungs really hurt. So, you know, I'm suffering from my art here. But anyway, I've, as I say, I've always loved this story. And you do see this trope, like I say, in other stories. But it's usually the devil who's supposed to be tearing things down. So I love the idea that this one's actually fairies or indeed land spirits. And like I say, there is slippage between fairies and land spirits anyway. But I hope you've enjoyed this whole month of exploring different types of fairy. And obviously I've focused on this particular neck of the woods because I do live in northern England. I am from this area, so it sort of made sense to introduce you to those types of fairy creatures or sprites that are basically in the legends of this particular area. Any excuse to basically sell where I'm from because it is brilliant up here. As I say, next week we will move on to witches. So we're going to be looking at things like the legend of the witch of Wookie Hall and stuff like that. I haven't decided all the stories yet, but if there are any particular witches that you would like me to focus on. I'm not doing the Pendle witches though because I think that they're so covered elsewhere. But if there are any in your particular vicinity in the British Isles that you'd like me to cover, then please do. Feel free to use the requests form below to drop me a note and let me know. I'm sticking to the British Isles for this one, though, again, just because the fact that I've only really got a certain number of weeks to cover it. And I can always come back to it and do other countries at a later date. So whenever I do a topic, don't think I'm only ever going to do it once. Like, how many times have I done plant-based episodes? You know what I mean? If you are a Patreon supporter, obviously I am still going to be doing the bonus episode and the illustrated talk, but because of the fact that I feel sick as a chip, I can't guarantee when that's going to be. 
So you will absolutely still get both of them. You'll get everything that you have paid for, but it's just the timing might be slightly different purely because of the fact that obviously I have COVID and I'm not well. I'm really bored and cranky at the moment as well. So there we go. Anyway, I hope that by the time this goes live on Saturday that I'm feeling a bit better because right now I'm incredibly ropey. So there we go. It's been a pleasure hanging out as always. If you do feel like you want to cheer me up in a very small way, you can always leave me a review if you haven't already. They are really helpful actually. Reviews do basically help the algorithm to know which podcast to recommend. So it's essentially it's quite helpful from like a technological point of view but it's also just nice for me to know what it is that you like about the podcast as well i'm going to stop waffling now and i'm going to let you go and do whatever it was you were doing before you started listening to this i hope you have a marvelous day ahead and i'll see you soon cheerio well thanks for listening and i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.